What's up guys, very excited. Today we have a bottle that I look forward to each and every year. Not so much the price of it though, <laughs> but if you're willing to spend the cash and you like the peatiest of sweetie peaty goodness, uh, look no further than Octomore from Brooklotti. This is the 12.3 and it's today's review on the Mash and Drum. What's up, folks? I'm Jason C. from The Mass and Drum. Today we are reviewing the Octomore 12.3, which was distilled in 2015 from the 2014 harvest of 100% Isla sourced Concerto Barley from Octomore Farm, grown by the godfather of soil himself, James Brown. The barley was shipped to Inverness and malted to 118.1 ppm or peat parts per million which is slightly lower than 12.1 and 12.2. Now it is cast strength but Brooklady mixes in just a drop of spring water from Octomore's farm natural spring to release more flavors but it still comes in at a nice and hefty 62.1% ABV. I'm going to pour this now, let it open up a little bit. Uh, just a little bit on Brook Lottie. Brook Lottie, or the Lottie, as, uh, is located on Isla and historically, you know, historically bucked the Isla trend by producing more mildly peated whiskeys as opposed to heavily peated, with character derived more from oak and barley varieties than peat. Now, in 2000, Gordon Wright, together with Mark Rainier and Simon Coughlin, were at the time hoping to buy and revitalize Brook Lottie, which closed in 1994. Now, by 2001, Brook Lottie gained a cult status for its rebellious approach to revitalizing the distillery behind the legendary Jim McEwen, who left Bamore and started producing numerous one-off releases using uh, maturing whiskey inherited from the previous owners of Brook Lottie. These one-off releases basically financed the distillery until its 10-year-old official bottling was ready. It also began marketing heavily peated releases under the name of nearby closed distillery Port Charlotte, and by 2012, Brook Lottie was sold to multinational spirits conglomerate Remy Cointreau. All right, so Octomore single malts were first distilled in 2002 and were developed to defy and challenge preconceptions of what constitutes a quality whiskey. Generally, not all the time, but generally, folks associate high age with better whiskey. Octomores are usually bottled at only around five years old. They're always super heavily peated and cast strength. And like every Brook Lottie release, they're all non-chill filtered. Now, Adam Hannett of Brook Lottie says the challenge is to focus on the four elements that contribute towards the depth and balance of a youthful whiskey. Is it the sourcing of the raw ingredients? Is it the careful selection of the wood's quality and style? Or is it the influence of nature, weather, climate, soil? Yes. All right, so what's in the Octomore 12.3? So the maturation for this one is as follows, 75% of it. The distillate was aged for five years in a first fill American Oak X bourbon barrel. The other 25% was matured for the full five years in first fill Pedro Jimenez sherry casks from Fernando de Castilla in Spain. Now the two batches were then married together in a neutral cask before being bottled. Again, 118.1 ppm, 100% Isla Grown Concerto Barley, non-chill filtered, 62.1% ABV or 124.2 proof. Price, 280 bucks, ouch. All right, so let's dive into this one, guys. I mean, the first thing you're gonna smell overwhelmingly is the peat and the smoke, but the reason why I love this one so much is because of that red fruit characteristic. There's a lot of sweet red fruits coming on in here, raspberry, maybe a little bit of raisin. And you wouldn't think with such a light whiskey, such a, you know, they don't add any color to this, um, just what comes out of the cask. But for something so light, you wouldn't expect, that's the, that's the amazing thing to me about uh, peated whiskey. Some of them can come in so sweet, 
um, even though they have so much smoke effect to them. I have this particular uh, brand of coffee bean sitting upstairs uh, when I grind it, and this fruity flavor comes out of it. That's what I, that's what's reminding me in the in the glass. It's reminding me of fresh ground coffee beans, but like a fruity, a more fruit forward variety of coffee bean. So you're getting the coffee bean, you're getting the the dark fruit flavors. Yeah, I'm getting a little blueberry in here too, chocolate. This is like all my favorite flavors of a good cigar in a glass, honestly. Fruity, coffee forward, a little bit of chocolate. Not getting a ton of oak, but the smoke is definitely prevalent, obviously, from being so high, highly peated. Yeah, the smoke, the smoke and the fruit characteristics are very well balanced. None, nothing's overtaking the other. So if you love peat, not too worried about the, the fruit taking over and vice versa. Cheers. Man, that hits you hard. So, being so youthful and so high proof, the peat, especially in the first sip, can come off extremely astringent, a little bit drying, but then as you just let it develop on the palate, the, those fruit flavors just really start developing, bringing himself out a little bit more. The red fruit, the raspberry, the blueberry, all there. Hmm. But man, that... That high peat, high proof definitely kicks you in the teeth a little bit. <laughs> mm. Second sip is where it's at. You still get kicked in the teeth a little bit by the by the peat and the prickliness of the proof. But man, once you get through that, raspberry, almost like raspberry cherry pie, a little bit of a crumb there to it. Pastry crust for sure. But, but like slightly burnt pastry crust, you overcooked it a little bit. That chocolate is still there. Definitely getting that in the mid palate. Yeah, these just get better and better. Yeah, it's almost like smoked chocolate. If you've ever had chocolate with a little bit of a hint of smoke in it. Or if, I mean, I mean if there's such a thing as barbecuing a chocolate bar, that's what it kind of, like if you barbecue a, like a Ghirardelli, chocolate you know the Ghirardelli chocolate squares with the with the raspberry in the middle if you could like put that on a on a barbecue or a smoker and just smoke it for a little bit that's what that's what I feel like I'm tasting here one last sip here again I, I want to emphasize that the PX sherry cask does not overtake the smoke it doesn't get overly sweet it's just there to balance it out the Isle of Barley, the smoke, the chocolate, that little bit of a medicinal quality that is so, you know, for a lot of people beloved in peat is there. And then I think the PX, the sherry just kind of balances out a little bit and then gives it that little punch of dark red fruit, which I think depending on who tastes it, you could probably pick up whether it be a raspberry, strawberry. Uh, let's add a little bit of water to it and see what happens. All right, so I'm just gonna drop in one, just a little bit of water here. And I just wanna see what that does to the whiskey, if it opens it, if it gets even more fruitier. Let's see. It did, the fruit actually got a little bit brighter. Instead of such a raspberry, I'm getting more of like a, like a ripe strawberry type thing. Like strawberry shortcake, whipped cream, vanilla. Getting a little bit more of the bourbon influence now coming through. Light caramel. Really interesting. Oh wow, I actually might like it better with a little drop of water in it. The chocolate and the coffee bean is still there. But man, that little drop of water just brought out even more fruit flavors. And it took away some of the medicinal harshness of the peatiness of this. It's just, it's, it's very balanced. This is a great whiskey. Now as far as price goes, 280 bucks to spend on a five-year-old whiskey is a lot to ask for anyone. Um, this is really for any of you out there that truly, truly appreciate high, uh, high peak content, medicinal flavors. It's not as meaty or ashy, like cigarette ashy as either an Ardbeg or Laphroaig, but I think I feel like what you do get, if you're a big fan of high peat, high intensity, high proof, with a little hint of some fruit, some more of a sweeter peat, then I think you'll absolutely love this. 
Now the 12.1 and the 12.2 are in that 250 to 260 range. This one's a little bit more expensive, but if you're staring at all three and you really just kind of want to spend the money on one of them, I've tried the 12.1 the 12.2. Both are good, but this is easily the hitter of the lineup. Um, if you're into those flavors, you will not be disappointed in Octomore 12.3. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this review for Octomore 12.3. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the subscribe button below. Please hit the like button. If you haven't yet, find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter. Let me know if you've had this one or if you've had all three of the Octomores uh, this year. And as I always say, it's not about the whiskey. It's the people you share it with. If I don't see you before the end of the year, Happy New Year, folks. See you soon right here on the Master Drum.